What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Victory Podcast. I'm your host, Steve McGrath, and this week I am pleased to bring you yet another NFL veteran as a guest, and this week it is Corey Proctor. Now, Corey was an offensive lineman that in 2004 was a 1AA All-American at Montana, undrafted rookie free agent in 05, signs with the Lions, and ends up playing four full years with the Cowboys and finishes his career one year with the Dolphins. Now, Corey took the time to talk about that journey, what it was like for him, and what he did after he retired, and that was become a financial advisor. Pro Capital Wealth Management, that is where you can find Corey now, where he's doing a lot of good. But before we get into that whole conversation, you know I need to remind you all that we are brought to you by Team Builder. And Team Builder provides strength and conditioning software to more than 500 high school football programs nationwide, as well as the NFL. So whether you write your own programs, have a full-time strength coach, or you need training programs, Team Builder can make your weight room more efficient, more accountable, and smarter when it comes to measuring your team's progress. Right now, Team Builder is offering a free 10-week spread offense tempo training program when you start a 14-day free trial at teambuilder.com, and that is only when you use the promo code VICTORY. Now, without any further ado, here's our conversation with Corey Proctor. Boom. All right. On the line, I have Mr. Corey Proctor. Corey, how are you doing today, man? Good. What's happening? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, you, you know, uh, in victory style, we love to get into guys' story, how they, they managed to navigate that path from being a high school athlete all the way through the NFL and, of course, life after. But breaking news, I don't know if you heard, Andrew Luck retired. Um, <laughs> That's right. Uh, Obviously, you're a guy that's dealt with his fair share of injuries. You know, just going off of your experience, you know, what do you feel when you hear that some guy that could have been the face of the NFL after seven years retires and just everything going on with Andrew? I understand him. You know, I had, uh, people don't realize what the NFL is and kind of the monster that it, 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 it can be on a guy's life. You know, and <clears throat> you go ask any wife, especially, uh, what's it like being an NFL wife? They'll tell you they they basically come second, or that's what they feel like a lot of times because the NFL demands your everything, and a guy has given everything to football up through that time through college, and he gets married. They realize that like, oh crap, this is this sucks because the wife should be take precedence over the job. When all right now, you know, she's kind of second tier to that, and. Not everybody treats it like that, but they, that's the demand that guys put into the game and the di game gets from them. So for a guy to finally put himself ahead of the game, a lot of people can't stand it, which is crazy. That's why you see the backlash from some different people, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, but, I'm, you know, I think awesome. I'm like, okay, I think, like, maybe he'll retire for a year and come back like Jason Witten did. But uh, – but if a guy's beat up, man, I understand that completely. I, you know, I got hurt in the game, my first significant injury, and all of a sudden I had five, uh, six, seven, eight surgeries later, and I didn't realize how beat up my body was. You know, but for guys who are dealing with that constantly, that's – it's not like you're just playing strong and dealing injury-free and you're just dealing with little nicks and pains, but when you're dealing through injury, injuries the whole time, you're putting double the work in normal guys are and that oh, yeah. drags your life down. It, Andrew said four years of this constant cycle. And I mean, it's obviously Rob Gronkowski just retired. So it's uh, do you think we're going to start to see a trend now that guys at the top are just making so, so much, they can get that financial security and whether it's, you know, five years to 10 years, do we, do you think that careers might now just be a little bit shorter because they can get that financial security and then not endure that beating for so long as guys in you know, the previous history have? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. Cause we're getting some bigger contracts. We're getting, they're getting more sizable to the point where, okay, we have enough guaranteed money. Um, some guys are treating it the right way. We're okay. I, I, I budgeted or I could prep, you know, kind of put it with my advisor or whoever and plan ahead and see what my, oh, uh, my future might look like from here right financially and what we can work with so i think guys are it's good okay we're getting to a better place where we can sustain our life to a point where yeah i can deal without football i can Definitely. deal without the abuse it's 
not like you ever cut problems out of your head, out of your life. But if I don't have to put my body through hell to, um, and I can go through to my next career, going to something I'm still passionate about, maybe even coaching and not have to kill myself over it. I'm going to do that. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it only makes sense, right? Um, well, of course you had to retire at some point and go through all this stuff. But before that, as we alluded to, you had to start somewhere. And so let's just take it back to 15, 16, 17 years old. You know, from what I could see, you're a great wrestler. You're a great high school football player. You're getting all these accolades. So you're a very talented athlete. How did the path for football unfold to you where you could ultimately go to a Montana and you know, play collegiately? You know, I wasn't – I didn't always play football. My first year was in seventh grade. <clears throat> I moved around a lot as a kid. Uh, you know, folks split up about nine years old. And over about a four-year period, I went to seven different schools. And so that's moving around a lot. You know, I move to a place and make a friend, and I'd, and I'd leave. I'd make a friend and I'd leave. You'd be close to somebody, I'd leave. And uh, and that can be uh, – that's, that's hard. So a lot of people can relate to that in a big way with over 50% divorce in our nation. Um, they go through those tough times. But, you know, I we land uh, Gig Harbor, Washington, and I get a guy – who stops me in the hall in seventh grade and invites me to play the game. Um, it was a big deal. You know, he just kind of invited me out because I was a big dude and never played football. I Let's see, I had uh, I had played softball, you know, in, in soccer one year, but I sucked at that. And um, when he saw a big dude, he said, hey, come, come hang out with us. I said, okay. And end up finding a gift that you know, I didn't know I had. And so, you know, I tell people, I just became this worker. And while my, you know, my life was kind of was in a tough place with my folks splitting up, um, I grabbed onto our coaches like crazy. Coaches, those became other father figures for me. They became huge guiding influences. And so because I, that first positive reinforcement that I got was like candy. So I became an insane worker just because I wanted you to praise me. And so because of that, I got it. And I just kept going after that and going after it. found, okay, I did pretty good in high school and, uh, and developed athletically and strong in the weight, got stronger in the weight room. And, and all of a sudden started getting recruiting. I had never, I, I never thought about that. And, um, you know, recruiting process came and that was really cool. I had a, scope done my senior year in the at the beginning of the season which kind of scared slowed me down and scared off some other schools but a lot of base guy schools came in and I ended up choosing Montana in Missoula and it's a one double a school and I loved it and uh you know we've been been through some pretty big up and downs and you could say if if then but this but um you know I was basically I was where God needed me to be and was able to make some amazing things happen out of the place I was at. So it was pretty amazing. It was just, that guy who made one invite and you think about something like this, this is a huge lesson for somebody who's out there. You think about it in the job where you might not have necessarily a good relationship with somebody, or you might you just might not like somebody very much, right? Or you might not know them at all, but you make one single invite that could potentially change their life. This guy invited me to play football which got me a college scholarship, found out I had a gift, got a scholarship, played in the NFL, played with the Cowboys, the Dolphins. That's where I met my wife. That's where I got my daughter. You know, I'm sitting here having this conversation right now. That's a powerful invite. So what was his name? Uh, Jeremy Coram. Shout out to <laughs> Coach Coram. I mean, right there, right? I mean, it, it deserves it, right? I mean, he that's kind of this moment. If it weren't for him, who knows where you're sitting today? Right. And that's, cool. that's where I'll, I'll use that in talks, but for anybody listening, I mean, there's typically somebody who like, it's not in your normal vicinity to go talk to, right? It might be a stranger or whatever, but something intrigues you or something stands out and it could be the pair of shoes they're wearing. It could be as simple as that. But if you don't take that and kind of bust through the barrier that, um, you know, we all essentially have before knowing each other, you'll never make those explosive moves in life. And that's, and if, if you don't call that explosive, that's you're blind because a guy made an invite that, okay, might've taken years to develop gift after gift and time after time, but it was a pretty amazing piece. 
Definitely. I'll plant those seeds all day. <laughs> oh, for sure. Right. And you only reap what you sow. So, you know, you're able to have this, of course, this explosive change. Uh, I just wanted to ask, though, you know, I saw it, you know, at, at growing up in New England, Stephen Neal was an offensive lineman who had a wrestling background and was able to have a good career with the Patriots. What did you find from being a you know, talented wrestler? How much did, you know, just understanding leverage in different parts of that skill set, how did that translate for you to play offensive line? Wrestling was big. I loved wrestling. You know, the only reason I got into it was because my first line coach, or first head coach, recommended it for players looking for another sport besides football. He said, hey, guys. Uh, I can't remember exactly how he, he phrased it, but he said, hey, guys, I would recommend everybody going out for wrestling. He wasn't even the wrestling coach. He goes, I'd recommend everybody going out for wrestling, especially you linemen, because this will help you become more flexible, become more aware in your body. You'll, you'll learn about leverage points, and it will make you an all-around better athlete. And, uh, and it's not necessarily just wrestling. This can be anything. This, uh, Nick Saban did a study also of a scholarship ask athletes at Alabama and multiple sport athletes coming out of high school were four times more likely to get a scholarship than single sport athletes. So it shows you during that developmental phase, you need lots of different aspects of athletic movement to work the different uh, spheres of the body because you nail down to one, you're limiting your growth. And so wrestling ended up being a huge part of that for me and not not just physically but it's a that's a demanding sport mentally it's a more of a one-on-one -on -one. so i had to over overcome you know these kind of internal fears of dealing with a guy one-on-one -on -one, getting into a fight one-on-one -on -one. football is full of those you don't even realize it and so if i can do that you start developing and weaponizing your body and your psyche in a big way that's awesome. And believe me, yeah. from having you know, about 60 or so guests at this point, that's a theme. Multi-sport athletes, particularly at a young age, that is something that almost to a man, every one of our guests can vouch for. So it just goes to show you, while it's great to have the option for those year-round camps and to always be doing football, not necessarily what actually translates to success and actually being able to play at the collegiate level. And then hopefully, you knock on wood, you get a chance to go on and do even further uh, you know, playing professionally. But, um, you know, what I want to ask, though, is, of course, you know, you do go to Montana and you don't just go there. Right. You work your way to being an All-American, one double A All-American. You know, you're all conference. So do you have any, you know, A, how did you sort of, you know, level your game up from high school now to now you become one of the best of your, among your peers at that level of competition? And then how do you then repeat that preparing yourself to go to the NFL? Okay, Every transition is going to come with some sort of. Uh flex, un uneasiness, you're not going to be fully prepared. You don't know how to you, – you're not fully prepared to swim unless you get in the pool, right? And so this, in the same way, you know, I worked hard. I got myself in shape physically. But until you got into camp with the coaches, you have to go through this, this growth phase in it, essentially so you can adapt. Um, I had fantastic coaches at Montana. I love them to death. I still think my O-line coach, Chad German, was one of the best coaches I've ever had technically and loved his guys, demanded a whole lot. When I got into the NFL, I was a big, big – I had a good attitude, good aggression, very big try-hard guy. And when I got to the NFL, you know, I was overthinking, over-stressing, overdoing a lot. So I needed uh, – most of my rookie year was on practice squad in Detroit. So I needed that practice squad time so I could – settle my mind physically I was ready right I still needed to mature more but physically I was ready mentally I had to adjust to playing with men in the game and that's where a lot of guys will fall out is you know they'll get into training camp you'll see this on hard knocks some uh they get hurt or hey man I got something wrong with me and there might be something wrong but you could you played through worse things and so guys will go hide in the training room. They'll go hide somewhere else and they'll hide behind an injury. And it's a good escape for something. And so this is why it's such a great um, indicator of, of what kind of growth you're ready for. Because if you can plunge into it and stick it out, because it's not easy, it's not fun, 
this is in a lot of different aspects of life, not just football. But if you can stick those moments out, uh, you'll be fine. You'll be okay. And because those will translate to marriage when you're arguing with your spouse and you don't want to deal with each other right now. That'll translate to your job when uh, this guy's trying to steal my sale or this guy's trying to steal my client or whatever the case may be. And, uh, or at least I think that, right? When I know he's trying to put food on the table for himself too and his family. So I can stop and sit there and remember that and I can go, hold up, I'm gonna approach this guy and I'm gonna deal with him with a good heart and not necessarily a vindictive one. And so you can understand those are pre preparation tables that you're eating at before you get to the actual feast. Absolutely. I love that. Um, you know, I, I did want to ask though, so you do spend most of your, your rookie year with the Lions before having you know your, the bulk of your career in Dallas. What was that like for you? Did you have expectations of getting drafted? And then, you know, that phone call that comes in, uh, I'm sure you were elated to get it, but were there any other offers on the table? How did the, you know, you getting to Detroit come to fruition? Well, so, you know, you have, when your agent is helping you come out of college, getting ready for the draft, depending on who you are, you know, they're usually prepping you some sort. You're doing combine training. I didn't go to the combine. I just did my pro day at the at Montana. But, um, you know, their projections were, hey, we think you might go as high as the fifth round uh, all the way to undrafted, right? And, okay, I had the most I knew. I talked to Atlanta, the Falcons, beforehand, and they said they had me as high as a fifth round draft pick. I said, cool, awesome. <clears throat> well, it never happened. Everybody wants to be drafted. You know, it's like I pick you to play the dodgeball game, right? And nobody wants to be picked last. And uh, nobody picked me, whatever. Then it came back down to the Cowboys, Atlanta, or Detroit. And Detroit didn't draft any linemen, so that's where we're looking for the best opportunity to make the team. So on my agent's recommendation, say, hey, I think Detroit might be our best bet. I said, okay, let's go. And that's how that came. Got it. Yeah. I mean, given that scenario, it seems like it was sound advice. Uh, however, I'm sure the way you see it is that the Lord had other plans because you, you're there for a minute, you end up with the Cowboys, a team that you just mentioned, and then for the next, you know, um, four years, it, you know, after that year, you're there. So, you know, A, what's it like getting that call? Hey, we're taking you off the practice squad. You're going to be, you know, moving you know, almost cross country, and you're going to have to get used to this new set of teammates. I mean, what's that whirlwind like for you? It's, uh, you know, you don't, you're not given much time to think, to be honest. Uh, and, and usually that's, the, uh, that's a lot, a big way in which God moves is like when he wants you to make something fast, it gets really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable quickly. And usually that's a sign for you to act even quicker. And, and so what happened there was, shoot, we had just fired Steve Mariucci as our, as our head coach in Detroit. I loved him. Uh, tough situation we we're at Tuesday night we we're at Chris Chelios's uh, bar restaurant Chelly's in uh, Detroit he was the captain of the Red, Red Wings at the time and we're sitting in his bar just eating dinner I think it was like nine o'clock at night and I get a call from my agent said hey Dallas wants to pick you up put you on the roster and uh, so then I'm like oh crap okay he goes well but now we're going to give Detroit the opportunity to match that offer and then we'll kind of decide what our best moves are because I've been in Detroit I knew their system now but the problem is they just fired their coach bring in a new coach you don't know what kind of guys he's going to want um, on the flip side Dallas had, is at the time oh uh, was looking like they were going to make the playoffs weren't sure because Bill Parcells was the head coach you weren't sure if he was going to stick around but <clears throat> he's a good coach doing really well good program there so and long uh, how that ended was Detroit wouldn't put me on the active roster they would match my pay and in the end we chose Dallas because they would put me on the roster I would get uh, credits towards my uh, accredited seasons or towards my um, free agency and so we, we went that route and ultimately it was the best one definitely and if you could just speak to, uh, a little bit more about Bill Parcells you know your time in Dallas, you know, Bill Parcells and Wade Phillips, two very well-respected coaches. And you had Tony Sperano as an offensive line coach. So maybe not just those three guys, but if you look 
take a step back and look at the bigger picture of coaches that you've had. I, I know you mentioned how much you loved your coaches in Montana. What to you made the best coaches? You know, I tend to gravitate toward the higher level because, you know, I know who Bill Parcells is and Wade Phillips, and I'm obviously not as well versed about your coaches, but from what you saw and what you played under, what made the best coaches special? What was it about them that they were able to have success on the field? You could tell the coaches that cared about you and who didn't. And, I, and I'll tell you, anybody out there knows what I'm talking about when I say, uh, uh, what boss did you like working for? Who, do you, who didn't you like working for? And typically, the guy you didn't like working for had no idea what your home life was like, had no idea who your spouse or your kids or anything else was like outside of work. So they didn't care about anything outside of work. So your, your entire life was predicated on your performance at work. And um, it's very much the same in football. So you would have these coaches that would yell and scream at you. And I've been yelled and screamed at plenty. Yell and scream at you. Um, but they had no idea who you were. So it's, it's hard to keep, you know, a really good uh, head or heart because when somebody doesn't care about you, they're the ones ultimately trying to lead you. And it's hard to follow a leader that doesn't care. And uh, when they only care about their performance or the performance of the team or whatever, it's going to fall short every single time. And if you got a leader, you have a coach, you have somebody that cares about you and asks you about your family, doesn't mean they can't, they don't coach you less, right? Doesn't mean they're less of a coach. It means you're more bought in and so are they. And so yeah. because they're more bought into you, you buy in more to them. This is where a lot of leaders in any job in any realm go wrong is <clears throat> I look at your film and okay, we got to judge by our film, but when I get you in, and if it's my job to coach you, to lead you to a better playing route, then I have to know everything that moves you. And that's where I'm saying there's a lot of guys to deal with, but I would, I would tell these, I tell these coaches, I go, when you guys get, when they, you get in the room, probe them, start talking to them. Like what's, Hey, how was your dad growing up? You know, how was your mom growing up? What was that like? And press them for answers. Because if you know this dude uh, used to have an abusive dad, you know, used to beat on him as a kid, he's probably not going to respond to a, a coach that screams and yells at him all day long. Uh, not as much anyways. Well, you know, another kid might take that just fine. And, and that's where I say is the coaches that I, I love Parcells. Because he would he would uh, feed you a compliment that was always backhanded. <laughs> he'd feed you a compliment. Um, he'd still yell at you, but he'd love you at the same time. You know, he caught he one time we we're in training camp, and uh, and I and I bring the language down right. I'm not going to cuss because it was more cuss words. But uh, he goes, he was telling me I was doing a good job. He's like, "You're all right, Grizz. Call me Grizz, Montana Grizzlies." He goes, "You're all right, Grizz." He goes, you're moving back and forth between both guards pretty good. You do it pretty easy. Not a lot, not a lot of guys can do that, but you're pretty smart. You're no genius, but you're pretty smart. And so he would feed you like that feel-good moment, right? He feeds you, make you laugh, kind of break the, the tension, and, but he cared about you. And he lets you know what he was thinking always, but he did care about you. And I'd rather have a guy who cares tells me what he's thinking all the time than have a guy that's ripping me up, doesn't care at all or not talking, doesn't care at all. Oh, for sure. I, having obviously not an NFL player, former NFL player, but I, I mean, to relate it just to everyday life. I, I, I mean, that's the manager that you would much rather be with someone that you know where you stand, that line of communication is open. I mean, it's just, it's a world of a difference, but um, uh, moving past that, I did want to talk just a little bit about playing offensive line. And I mean, you played, you know, you had a chance to uh, play with uh, and practice with Larry Allen. And then later on, I mean, Andre Giroud, I mean, you have Flozell Adams, uh, you know, Leonard Davis comes in. I mean, you, you were consistently surrounded with pro bowl talent. Did you, were you able to learn much from them to your point about physically? I, I just feel like it's so close amongst, your peers when you're at the NFL, right? Those physical differences between one another shrink, but the mental differences and just the small things, and that's where really you can separate yourself from one another. Did you pick up any things from these guys? And um, 
it seemed like you had a pretty uh, good relationship with Mark Colombo as well, because you guys maybe messed around a little bit in the music world. But, you know, from just when you're in that group, how did you guys sort of like learn from one another and kind of an iron sharpens iron type of way? Well, well, I mean, one big thing I learned there is guys, guys are different. Guys, guys learn differently. Guys act differently. They prepare differently. Not everybody looks the same. Not everybody's one cookie cutter method. And, and that's, that's a hard, probably the hardest part as a leader is to understand that everybody's wired differently. So you have to come at them in different ways. And so anyways, you know, the biggest ways that we would arm each other is by getting to know each other out of the locker room, out of the field, off the field. And if you want to grow as a team, you got to hang as a team. And so that's where Colombo and I became really close because we were working out in the, in the, in the weight room together, realized two hard ass dudes who like to work and like to lift weights. And so we were hung out together. We started, we gained respect first. And then we would talk about metal music or rock music, stuff that we liked. And then I found out he was in a band in Chicago when he was there. I'm like, holy crap, I play the drums. And he goes, I got a kit in my house. Let's go jam. And so we find out these things and then we go hang outside of football and we're playing around, screwing around. And then, uh, you know, go to movies on Tuesday mornings when there's nobody at the theater and just smoking popcorn and, and nachos like crazy and, and loving and giggling like a bunch of little girls. And so we would do that stuff all the time, go hang out. And, but through those, you would hear the stories of guys' lives. I, so I hear story, I'd hear Leonard was like, man, you got to meet my mom. So I go hang out with him in Wortham, Texas and meet his mom, you know, who influenced him in a big way and got, got, you know, sat there and eat biscuits and, and, uh, bacon with boar bacon with brer rabbit syrup all over it. And, and that, that stuff is the coolest thing because that's the iron sharpens iron because all of a sudden now I'm living in a world that disrupts what I currently have. So I tell people, like I was, I went to Gig Harbor High School. It's primarily white high school. We had probably like one one black guy in the whole school. I I went to Montana, that might have five black guys. I went to the NFL in Detroit, where I was now the minority. And and now I'm in this discomfort place. And this is the place God wanted me to be. Why? Because He needs to expand my perspective and my territory. He goes, I can't have you being a leader out in the world unless you know the world and so this is the same way how we sh- iron sharpens iron is your testimony is what sharpens other people's testimony my, hearing your testimony your story broadens my perspective of what god has to offer and i'm like it. new revelation all the time so cool um and, and you know we're, we're going a, a little longer than i wanted so while i feel like we could go down this for hours um, I, I do just want to ask, um, heading into retirement, you do have the one last year of your career in Miami. And of course, you have a knee injury there. Can you just talk what it was like for you to have to make that decision? Do I stop pursuing this? And then once you make that call, how do you sort of you know, reinvent yourself and figure out what the next step is? You know, uh, I was like most guys. I didn't make the call to retire. Guys get hurt or the league just doesn't want you back. (laughs) And that's just what it is. And it's hard to deal with. It sucks. It feels like uh, rejection. Somebody's breaking up with you and you don't want it. Um, But I got hurt, went through a whole lot of surgeries, tried to come back, had workouts. It went really well, but I didn't get picked up. Went through some super frustrating times. Um, But at some point, this is where I'd push guys to do this earlier than I did, but at some point I had to make a choice to start moving for myself and not the potential of somebody else moving on my behalf. And, and this is a huge thing because when you start moving on your behalf, other people will move on yours. And so what was hard is I turned down opportunity. I turned down a, um, Oh, uh, in 2011, I turned down a 10 year reunion of our 2001 national title game from Montana because I was like, I could get a call for a workout. Well, that's BS, man. Why would I miss an awesome moment? And even if I did get a call, that's what I want. So it would be a win 
either way. And so, so many guys, they're putting off so much in their life on the chance that they might get an NFL offer or, or might get a contract or might get this or might get a whole different. I'm like, stop doing that. Start making choices for yourself right now because people will see that and they will act on those actions. And you will create activity around you by making movement happen. And so, I, but that was a tough transition for me because I'm dealing with this. Who am I now? And I didn't, I didn't get into a crazy amount of interest besides music while I was playing. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And so that was a bigger shift for me, like a lot of guys, because now I'm trying to figure out who the heck I am and I got to get a regular job. You know, turns we had some crazy stuff happen, but, um, you know, somebody invites us to church one day that kind of turns the fire on in me and I start developing, developing a flame for something I never had when I was playing ball. And because I had a relationship with my maker, the guy, the guy who made me, the guy who died for me, I started understanding the depth of that relationship. And I started understanding the depth of what he put into my life before up to that point. And what was cool is now I started consuming at a huge rate, which was the activity that started happening. And we started having these kinds of conversations. So I started getting speaking gigs. It led into me opening up my own financial practice and like all these different avenues that I wouldn't have chosen or I wouldn't have been on fire for hadn't I got a relationship with my God. That's awesome. Um, yeah. and, and as we move toward closing though, um, if you want to speak a little bit more about pro capital, I, I mean, obviously this is, you, you were able to construct a path for yourself. I mean, in while it seemed like for you, there didn't seem like there was going to be much chance that things were going to go dark for you, weren't going to work out, you know, everything did. And this is the path that you created. So, you know, I'd love for you to be able to just have a moment to, to talk about why financial services and, and what it is that you're doing now. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I ended up, Oh, opening pro capital wealth management, which is uh, my business on top. I broker dealer through a company out of Minnesota Woodbury, which only deals with independent agents. But I, I went through my advisor. I, I did, uh, I put a lot of my funds with my advisor uh, when I was playing and she did really well for me and earned every dollar of what she was making. And, uh, and so I saw that <clears throat> took an interest and uh, just because I wanted to know what the heck my money was doing. And, and a lot of that was faith driven too. Um, a lot of people don't know. There's a verse out of if I'm, I'm saying, it's Luke or Matthew, one of the gospels says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, a lot of people don't know. They usually hear that at a funeral or from the pulpit, somebody preaching, this is what I want to hear one day. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, they don't, they don't know where that path or where that passage stems from. That is said one time in the Bible and it's said in the parable of the talents when it's dealing directly about money. And <clears throat> what it is, is twofold. It's one, God wants to understand that your heart is not driven by money, it's driven by him. Money is a byproduct of him. Um, two, how you steward what you're given in your life from God will determine his blessings after that. So, uh, in that story, you have three guys, one gives one talent to, one gives two talent to, one gives five talents. And talents, back in, uh, in, in biblical day, 2,000 years ago, a talent was a lifetime worth of wages. That's what a talent was. Not necessarily this guy could do a lot, right? Talent was a lifetime worth of wages. So, you could essentially get, think about up today, how much money you accumulate up till 55 or 59 in your retirement age can be several million dollars right as um okay you've been just handed a million or more lifetime worth of wages and you've handed you have to take care of this the first guy went and buried his money in the dirt he wanted to protect it second guy went and doubled it the other guy went and doubled it too so they went and traded it in the markets and they went and did their thing and they turned that money into more money so that god jesus comes back and he finds out what they did and he chastises the guy who buried the money. And he says, he calls him wicked. He goes, you're a wicked servant. He goes, you're basically deal, dealing with a spirit of fear that I'm going to condemn you for potentially losing money. These guys went out, traded in the market, and tried to increase for him. 
And so he blesses them for it. So what's cool about it is the big faith aspect is like, we are supposed to understand this realm that uh, a lot of people have a have fear stepping into. And when you have fear stepping into, what do you deal with past that? How many marriages end in divorce because of money? Uh, out of all the divorces, I'd imagine that that's a, probably at least 50% of them. It's the number one cause of divorce, money. Makes and sense why, to me. Why is it? It's, it's huge. And why, and why is the case? Well, typically, and I know you're in this field, so you can say, typically you have uh, one spouse working the finances and the other one is not. And I'm not saying that's bad, but when one spouse is not involved, what happens? This happens a lot of times I see the guy is working and the wife is handling the spouses. One guy says, he goes, I make the money and my wife spends it. And I go, okay, well, what happens when the husband decides he wants to spend some money and the wife's like, we don't have that. And all of a sudden he starts flipping a lid. What are you doing with my money? Now it's a territorial thing. And there is division now brought into the home because um, of, of a small conflict because you guys didn't know what was going on with the finances. One guy's not comfortable or he just doesn't know, so he doesn't go into it. When really God is trying to put both of you into that boat so you can come out a sharper tool in the end. And so you steward that the right way. And this is every aspect in our life, including the politics that are going on. Going on. But uh, you steward that in the right way. He's going to bless you with it. People, people will give tithe or they'll give, they'll give a lot of money away. And they'll be like, hey, why isn't God giving me back? How come I'm not seeing this back? Because typically what you give, you get, right? How come I'm not getting this back? Well, um, if you're a bad steward, he's not going to give you anything. Why? Because you can't manage it. And so you'll see a, a downfall all right, in players or a lot of winners in society because people can't manage their finances. They never had a budget in the first place. So it goes away. So anyways, I know I'm going off, but I was really interested in this as a face side because so many people struggle with that. Um, where my advisor and I took an interest, but she did really well with me. And so I was thankful for that. I dove in to see the reasons why, and I took an interest and ended up opening my own practice. So <laughs> it's cool. It is. I love it. I love the story. Just like there's a chance encounter with a coach at a young age, by chance, you got a great advisor and look at, the next chapter of your life. So it's, it's just one of those things where uh, right place, right time, right person. And I'm very happy for you that you've been able to set up your own practice. It seems like everything's going well. And obviously you have a why that you are latched onto. So I'm sure there's only bigger and better coming. <laughs> now, Corey, we always end the victory podcast with what I call the gauntlet. A couple quick hitter questions. I need your knee jerk answer. Okay. What's most important? Number one offense or number one defense? Oh, well, my biased answer is the offense. I mean, so, I, mean I, I would say offense. You got to score. If you can't score, you're not going to get in the game. Fair enough. Do you have a favorite football memory? Oh, there's lots. On the field, Monday night football against the Philadelphia Eagles, Donovan McNabb. It was my first start at home for the Cowboys in Texas Stadium. I killed it. And Monday Night Football, I get announced out of the thing, get announced on national television, have an awesome game. We end up going and winning like 37-35. Big, big high-scoring game, and it was awesome. It was, it was really cool. Very cool, indeed. Now, did you have a pregame ritual that you stuck to? Pregame ritual. I don't know about a pregame ritual. I always took uh, – I take a lot of pre-workouts. <laughs> so I always take a, a big shot of some sort of pre-workout with some electrolytes to make sure I'm, I'm amped up and ready. Love it. Uh, now, did you have one coach or one player that you just wish you would have had the chance to work with? Oh, I always liked, um, from afar, everybody looks great, right? But I always liked Pete Carroll. He's up in Seattle right now. I've heard that he's just an infectiously happy guy, infectiously positive coach. And so because of that, it, it rains down on his players like that. And so 
everybody loves being around them, and it's, it's no doubt that they've been able to have some good success. So I've always thought that would have been cool. Yeah, they, they've certainly had a very unique feel in Seattle. It's very different from everywhere else in the NFL. Um, scheme or players, which is most important in winning? Players, no doubt. You have the best scheme in the world. You have the wrong players, you're not going to win. I'd, I'd say a lion leading a pack of sheep, sheep will always beat a sheep leading a pack of lions. I love that. I'll take that for sure. Now, this is the last one, and it's the most important one. What's the one best piece of advice that you would give to someone? And if you need a little more construct on it, typically we look for, you know, 17, 18, you know, the young kid that maybe wants to be the next Corey Proctor. What's the best piece of advice that you could give? Uh, <clears throat> faith, get, a faith base, I would get around a church that is on fire for God. And, and I'm talking about like real people that are on fire, not that are fake church people, the fake, the hypocritian garbage, right? I, I'm talking about people that can talk real for you, that have been down life. I always say, don't trust anybody without a limp, right? Somebody who's been abused, people have got to put those people through some abuse, uh, ultimately to get them to a promise that is a lot bigger than this world wants them to have. So <clears throat> what I'd say is get, get into church, understand this place that God wants you to have. And on top of that, the biggest thing that comes from it is all of a sudden you will have a conviction in this life. You'll have an understanding that you will live way more intentionally about every move that you make. That will lead to bigger moves in your, in your life. People will follow you. People want to listen to that guy. They want to talk to that guy. They want to be friends with that guy. So many problems we have today, the, high, the rise in suicides in, in young adults, the, um, the divorce rates, the subsequent divorce rates. Oh, uh, the shootings we have, all these issues, the, uh, the, the, um, I'll, I'll even go out there. Some people might not like it, but the gender confusion, gender dysphoria that goes on right now, a lot of it happens because of the lack of identity, the lack of values that we have in our life. And when you just say you can live how you want and make your own choice, how you want, that leads you up to anything that my, the enemy might put in your path. That means your your mindset can go down a very destructive place. And if you're not on purpose about what you value and how you convict your steps, then you will go down any path you, that enemy wants to take you. And I, I, and I don't care. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'm inclined to agree with everything you just said. <laughs> it is. It's, it's huge. And, I, and listen, and if people, you'll deal with opposition. If anybody disagrees with me, that's fine, right? They can have their disagreement, but typically when somebody's on a mission, they don't really care what other people think. Good point. <laughs> I love it. Corey, thank you so much for coming on and taking the time, man. And for everyone, again, that's Pro Capital. Is Where else can everyone keep up with you and follow you? Uh, you can, ProCapitalTX.com is that site. Otherwise, I do a lot of speaking engagements. So you can, so CoreyProctor.com, C-O-R-Y-P-R-O-C-T-E-R. -E Follow me on social media, at Corey Proctor, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Say hello to the man. Corey, thank you again. <laughs> Appreciate it.